What does it look like to be an artist today? Do we have to be full time in some other career and, we, and it means we can't be an artist? Like, do you just see this optionality where you never have to pick between one or the other these days? Man, that's such a dope question. I think we have to redefine artistry from the ground up in order for it to really be effective. I think with the way the internet has evolved, with the way that content has evolved, we really got to revisit the roots of like, what's the purpose of artistry? What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brian Man Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. Today we are here with a very special guest, Brandon Torrey. He is an artist. He is an entrepreneur with a tech background, developer background. He's one of those unique com combinations. He's a unicorn of his own right. But today, one of the big things we want to talk about is his company, Formless, which is described as a community of like-minded individuals where anyone can go to be themselves and take part in the future of the internet. But when we break it down, it's a way for artists, creatives, I would say, from my understanding, to empower themselves, to make sure that they're getting the money that they deserve from their creations. Did I get that part about right? You did, you got it 100% right, thank you. For sure, for sure. Man, I mean, like, I want to start and just give a little bit of a context before we get deep into the um, like the platform and just the the philosophy that drives the platform. Um, but you were an artist. You are still an artist. My bad. Like working with Timbaland, uh, Dallas Austin, multiple super producers, which is like crazy. First and foremost, these guys are legends. And like, but you also had this, you know, developer ta talent. You worked at a Google and things like that. So what drove you to start building this platform? Was it from one of the experiences you had as an artist or did it come some other type of way? Yeah, great question. First off, I want to thank you guys for having me. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I worked with you guys for a number of years on, on some projects and stuff. So it's really dope to come back full circle. Joe. For me, it really started when I was a kid. Um, I actually was more passionate about technology from a very young age. I had super young parents. They was like 18, 19 when they had me. So we had a lot of financial troubles. And um, I ended up bouncing around the city. I lived in motels, homeless shelters, family members' houses when I was a kid. And technology was this thing that I was just super, super passionate about. So I wanted to be a hacker since I was a kid. And um, at the same time, in the, in the neighborhood, formless, not formless, but hip hop was like the language we all spoke. So for me, that kind of, um, that dichotomy between those two identities was where the word formless came from. I went on to become an engineer, as you mentioned, at a couple of big companies. Uh, but at the same time, I'm still an artist. You know, I'm still an artist to this day. And I think for me, I was living in Los Angeles. I was putting out records. At the time, Tim, Timberland had discovered me. I had a million streams on Swish, which was one of the records I had out at the time. So everything's going pretty well, but I'm not really making any money. And the key thing for me as an artist, was it wasn't just the money piece. It was looking at the amount of money I put in, in terms of a marketing budget, a production budget, and then looking at, looking at how much I was able to make out, uh, make back out. And so for me, that just didn't seem sustainable. And um you know, I decided to go back into technology and see if there was something I could do to uh, to kind of solve this problem. And uh, that's really where Formless came from and where this technology that we call Share uh, was born. Got you. Got you. I mean, it's, it's so interesting to me that, I mean, I don't know. So you took on two different languages, right? Hip hop is a specific language, right? It was still coming up. Programming is a specific language. And to see you come up with this platform and really continue to be legitimate in tech, not just I know tech. I know a lot of people that are like, they're reading the news and they're sharing some of the stuff, but they're not, they don't really understand it, right? Um, to, see one, to see somebody like you like continuing as an artist, it makes me wonder your thoughts on what does it look like to be an artist today do we have to be a full-time artist? Can't, do we have to be full-time in some other career and, we, and it means we can't be an artist? Like, do you just see this optionality where you never have to pick between one or the other these days? Like, have people kind of limited their, their view of artistry? Man, that's such a dope question. I think we have to redefine artistry from the ground up in order for it to really be effective. I think with the way the internet has evolved, with the way that content has evolved, um, we really got to revisit the roots of like, what's the purpose of artistry? And I think, you know, building a business and being an entrepreneur at the same time is kind of like the multi-hyphenate creative thing. I definitely think that's the future. And for the audience members who may not know, I think the way that, uh, that we actually connected, Sean, was I, 
at the time when I was doing the multi-dream thing, when I was living both lives as an engineer and an artist, yeah, you had done that YouTube video, which was really dope. You talked about this concept of multi-dream. And then uh, we actually worked together on Unicorn, which was the album that I put out with Dallas. And that whole thing, you know, back then, even until now, was about, is there a way that we can blend these two identities? And I really think that that's going to be the future. I, I don't think... I don't think it's sustainable to continue to focus strictly on entertaining people. I think we have to use art for the purpose of something bigger, uh, whether that's business or a message or something else. Mm. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm wondering, man, because you know, you, we meet a lot of artists who do have, I guess, non-musical talents and, and non-musical skills, right? Like, like you're coming from tech, but just at this point, just people from from various spaces. And you know, one of the big concerns that I have sometimes is like, hey, I don't want to feel like either the image of me doing this thing is taken away from my artist brand, or I don't want, you know, maybe the energy that I put into it to take away from um, the work I feel like I need to put into the music. And it, it sounds like you you found, you know, one piece with balancing the two brands, but then also found, figured out how to kind of balance those two spaces. So I'm just wondering like, one, um, did you have any initial concerns around that? Um, just the, the battle between artist image and, and, and business image. Um, and if so, like, what are some of the conversations you had with others or, or had to have with yourself that helped you, um, you know, walk yourself to the other side of that and, and, and help you realize um, whatever you need to realize that put you in the space you're in now? Yeah, I had a huge issue with it. I mean, for a long time, I didn't tell any of my friends that I even was in tech, especially when I was in L.A. and I'm in the studio. I didn't want people to know that I was kind of, split in both of these worlds you know what i mean for me it was 100 percent artistry and it was uncomfortable i was insecure about it for sure um what helped me was honestly was my sister my sister said yo tech is actually dope you need to be who you really are you need to tap into your into your actual story and for me it was a, it was a really big breakthrough um i also just started to feel like being an innovator is, is actually doper than just being an artist in my opinion and i and i think it's actually pretty dope if you can find a way for multiple talents to come together to improve the experience uh, for people at the end of the day anyway. What's the difference between an innovator and an artist? I think, actually, I think that's a good question. You could argue that they're the same thing. I think artistry as people think of it now is kind of limited to different mediums, whether that's like a uh, audio artist or musician or like a visual artist. Yeah. But I think in the future, like innovation is, you know, the, the same way you could drop a record, you should be able to drop a new piece of software. You should be able to drop a new building, like architecture. You should be able to drop a new a new pair of sneakers. Like anything that you want to create, I think you should be able to create. And I think with the way technology is going, it's going to be a lot bigger than the mediums that people think of right now when they think of artistry. So you're, you're right. I think artistry and innovation are very, very closely linked, if not the same thing. But the way people use the word, I think is going to evolve. I got you. I got you. Yeah, I think there's an argument that the a lot of artistry is more technical and purist, right? So you can be an artist without being an innovator, but somebody who innovates tends to be an artist in some form or fashion, right? Uh, even if it's not within the art mediums, right? Because you, by nature, innovation is converging these worlds, whatever those two things that don't belong together, you know what I mean? Well, you know, you used the word that was dope earlier, which was language, right? We said like the, the hip hop language, the programming language. The thing about art is that you want to get to the point where the language is so so seamless that you could just express. Like yeah. a lot of my favorite artists, like, yeah, like it's like, it's just pure expression, but he's so good at it that his pure expression happens to also be like flawless art for me in terms of what I like to, to hear. And so that's the goal you want to get to in all the languages that we speak, whether that language is technology or hip hop or or fashion. The, the goal is to get to the point where the language is so smooth that you could actually blend those two languages. And, me, and to me, that's innovation. It's like being in a zone. That's what I think about from, from a sports standpoint, where you do all this work, right? But you get to the point where you don't have to work for the thing to come out and impact. Artists, managers, there is no way you should ever do a regular pre-save campaign again because Forever Fan has Forever Saves, where a fan could pre-save your music one time and then automatically pre-save every song you ever release after that. That's right, forever. And on top of that, Forever Fan has email and texting 
all in one platform. This is built out for artists who don't have huge teams and don't want to get overwhelmed doing too many things in too many different places. So go to foreverfanmusic.com slash no labels. That's no labels with an S and put in the code no labels O2 to get access and try it out for only a dollar. Foreverfan is your go-to place for your marketing needs as an artist so you can stay organized, have your own infrastructure to make it a lot easier to go to the next level. Again, that's foreverfanmusic.com slash no labels and type in the code no labels O2 at checkout to get access for only a dollar. Now back to the episode. In the beginning, you have this vision and it's very creative and it's very much like, yo, I'm going to change the world. It's going to be this beautiful thing. Yeah. Okay, boom. And then you got to get into the operational mechanics of making it happen. And that almost grinds all of the creativity out of you because you have to be a machine. You have to be a machine. And then you get to the highest level where it's like, no, we need you to go back to being creative again because that's actually what people yes. understand. Yeah. And if they were sports, right? Like if you look at our favorite athletes, in the beginning, you want to do all this creative stuff. Then you have to get super technical until the point you're actually really good. But then you look at Kyrie now, he's just, it's just expression. You know what I mean? He's an artist. An artist, man. He's an artist, like for real. Yeah, I think that's such a perfect way to think about it. And you know, when people try to skip these steps, and even in business, I think you get it because you've on you're on these sides. But I've told artists, I'm like, yo, like y'all get so caught up in this box of just following the strictest version of an artist, and you're only you're only even following the artist in your lane that you don't realize that there's other artists outside of your lane that are cool or doing some cool things worth pulling. Then you don't realize there's other people outside of the music industry or the technical terms of arts. Like I've, like, I've told artists like, yo man, I've met programmers that are more creative than a lot of y'all artists are, right? Like, but like, but the, cause the creative is the creative. You can't like really turn that off. And when you, what you mentioned about once you get to the top of the game in business, to be ahead, you still have to be creative yet again. It's, it's an interesting thing that I feel like we shouldn't lose at, in any facet because it just all transfers across. Like everything that you just said about Kyrie, well, basketball and business, same for an artist. I got a, I love, I would love to rap like X person, right? And I got, I, I'm doing all this in my head, but then I actually drop some bars and it don't sound like it sounded in my head. And the whole goal is to become good enough to express what's in your head the way it sounds in your head and to connect with people that way. And that's what the the grind technical part becomes. Exactly. And it's the same thing with programming. It's the same thing with business. It's all the same thing. And that, that was the, that's actually why I named it Formless. Because mm -hmm. yeah, we can actually do multiple things. We, we don't have to be a rigid identity. If you're good enough for whatever the foundation is, you should be able to apply it in different domains. Mm. So what's the philosophy? I get that part right there, Formless. Like, but what other tenants? Because I know monetization is a big one. Um, well, I even rewind it here. Why, why do you think that creators in general have so much trouble making money anyway? And how does this help solve that? Great question. So I think for me, it was, it was a journey of, of self-exploration. Um, in the beginning, so my wife was working at Morgan Stanley at the time. She said, you should really look at blockchain technology. I think this is going to you know, be revolutionary. And I was skeptical. So I, you know, I was like, I, it seems very vague. I don't really see how it's going to apply to me as an artist. And um, so you know, like a lot of people, I just didn't see how it was going to be effective. And I did more research. I went deeper into it to understand what the technology actually was. And what I thought was, OK, there's a control problem in on the internet let's you know it's music but let's just say the whole internet where basically if you have a, a song a video a podcast anything like that a social media post what you're doing is you're taking this file you then give it to a corporation the corporation that makes all the rules they decide who can advertise on it they decide how much money you can make they decide whether or not you get the data of the people that are interacting with that and so you do this trade-off where you say i'll give all the control because i want to get distribution right so my thought as an engineer was, well, if I could actually take the file and turn it into a program that could self-administer its own rights. In other words, the royalty management should be self-administered. The data should be self-administered. It could be this little self-contained program. Then that would solve it. And so blockchain happened to be a technology that enables you to do this. So that was the, the initial kind of idea. And we called the technology shared technology. So to your question, it was, 
all right, how do we get rid of the middleman, get more control for artists? That way artists can do things like set the price, get the data for who's listening, still be compatible across different platforms, all this great stuff. So we built that. Now, the problem is this. I actually don't think that's the real problem <laughs> for artists. I think that the monetization piece is a symptom of a deeper problem, which is actually the identity problem. And so I think ultimately what's really happening is monetization works pretty well for certain artists on the internet already today. And so what, the real issue is that most artists don't want to do the things that you have to do to monetize. And I've seen you guys talk about this, right? Whether it's create a bunch of TikToks or do a bunch of marketing, things, all these things. It's not that it doesn't work. Is that we don't want to do it. It doesn't match what we consider to be our identity. And the pushback is always, well, like, okay, if that's what it takes and you don't want to do it, then maybe you don't want it bad enough, right? So that's kind of like a conundrum where it's like, all right, you have the monetization piece, but then you got the identity piece and you got people that want to do multiple things and maybe they don't want to subscribe to the steps that you have to take to be successful with algorithms today. So um, essentially when we built the technology, we started to see this. It happened a lot because a lot of artists would say they wanted this technology, but then when it was time to use it to go direct to consumer and do these things, there was a lot of pushback because artists were like, well, I'm not sure if I actually want to go direct to consumer or if I actually want to do these things. So, and that's where the identity problem really became more and more obvious. So I had to think about it for myself. Like, all right, what is my real problem? What do I really want? And I think what it came down to was it's not so much the monetization piece. It's just the ability to grow. So like right now on Instagram or on any social media platform, the algorithms are tuned so much that like, like forget the money piece, just like growth, you know, month over month or year over year is very, very difficult because the algorithms intermediate and kind of control the distribution based on whether or not it matches their goal as a platform. So when we realized that, we started to focus on a different thing. So the monetization piece is still there, but we started to focus on a different idea. And this was the video that I put on Instagram that, that got a lot of views, where I took a song and I turned it into what's called a smart contract. It's basically an electronic contract. I went on Twitter Spaces with 200 people. I said, yo, everybody who taps this link, we're gonna make money together on the song. I put a couple of businesses in the, in the contract. So Symphonic Distribution was in there, Dallas Austin Distribution was in there. And then everybody else was just live. Whoever was on the space, you could join. And so the next day the song came out and everybody started to tweet about it. People started to talk about it because we were all on the same team. And so this feeling for me, I realized was more important than the money. It was the team element. Like, yo, if we could all be on the same team around this song, now it feels a lot different, especially if I can get the data around who's on the team. So that was kind of phase one. So we did that and the distribution was a lot easier to get than it was uh, in the traditional way. And I put that on Instagram, we got 12,000 shares. So it was, the, it was the most successful post I've ever done on, on Instagram. When people saw that, they was like, yo, this is crazy. We want this. And so we started to think about, well, what if we did that without the song part? What if I didn't even have to sell a song? Mm. What if I could just take anything and make it community owned? And this is when it got crazy. So we said, all right, let's take a Twitter post, turn the Twitter post itself into a piece of community owned property. Anybody who retweets this, you're going to get a link. You're going to instantly enter into an agreement. Whereas the views go up on the Twitter post, we're going to automatically pay the entire community in real time using digital currency over a 24 hour period. Let's see how viral we can make the post go. So we did that with an artist named Latasha and got 50,000 views over a 12 hour period. And so I'll pause there, but basically that's the thing that we've been understanding and learning is that it's not just monetization. It's really how do we innovate on community and turn the internet from you know, followers and fans to what I think the next version in, which is, uh, is, which is teams. That's interesting. That's interesting. So turning your, I mean, I guess it's like any old investment, right? Like if I got Coke stock or Apple stock, I might be a little bit more likely to use it when you think about it on the base level. So it's not that it doesn't make sense, right? Like we haven't done something like this before, but if we take something like a, a tweet, for example, how does that become financially viable in that process? Great question. So, so one of the words you used was investment. And I actually, I wouldn't, I actually wouldn't use that word. So as an artist, I never really wanted to ask people to invest in my stuff. So it wasn't uh, purchase something in exchange for being a part of this. It was actually, I just want to reward you based on history. 
So if you retweet this, if you've retweeted this in the past, if you came to a show, if you've done something and you're part of my community, you can join the splits on this contract. Wow. So there's no investment piece. That's that's really important, right? There's no investment piece at all. It's much more about behaviors and team dynamics. So it's completely free. So there's no there's no downside risk. Now the question is, all right, what's the upside risk? How do we make sure that it makes money? Well, there's a couple of different ways. So I would divide it into three categories of like revenue sources. The first revenue source would be direct to consumer sales. So let's say you want to sell a song, you want to sell access to a video, you want to sell merch. You can actually take that and connect it to a smart contract and then distribute that revenue amongst a team or a collective. What's dope about this is it's an unlimited size. So you could do this with not just 100 people, but 1,000 people, 10,000 people. So that's revenue source number one. Number two is you could actually just take your marketing budget. So what we did, we actually uh, partnered with a brand named IYK based out of New York. They, they came to us and said, we're willing to just take our marketing budget and just pay a collective of co-owners on this tweet to make sure that it hits 20,000 views in the first 12 hours. If it exceeds uh, 20,000 views in 12 hours, we'll put another $1,000 into the contract and pay the community. So we did that. That one also got 54,000 views in 12 hours. So people basically are saying, we would rather do this than advertise because now the customer acquisition cost is going down. And not only am I getting the impression, I'm also getting the email address of everybody who joins these contracts. So now you can do it over and over again. So it's a platform where you can get a uh, lower cost, higher quality engagement, not just the music side, but for any piece of property on the internet. Wait, so let me understand this. Like, let's use the New York brand as a case study. Just it was like crystal clear for, for me. And then hopefully everybody else under, understands as well. All right, so I'm a, a brand that has a marketing budget, right? That's what they were, right? Like just a, a brand, you have a marketing budget. I'm just trying to figure out what I want to market. What was the thing that they were trying to market? So they had a contest called uh, Creator Chipped. So they, they create NFC chips for clothing. And so they essentially are trying to get a lot of creators to create clothes and use their chips to put on the clothes. Okay, so, so they put a tweet together that announced that contest. That was the thing they wanted to, to. All right, I got a contest about this um, where I'm going to reward people for winning this contest. But that reward, so, but that reward for winning the contest is separate from this whole like the form list of marketing aspect. So I hire you. Let's just pretend you're an agency. Obviously, it's not an agency, but like I'm just trying to figure out how how do I want my stuff to come out uh, to be marketed. I go to you, and then. You, you put it on the website and anybody who retweets it, they get a piece of the marketing budget. Is that what, what happened there? So basically you come to me and you say, I would like for you to create a smart contract that represents this Twitter post or this X post mm -hmm. as a piece of property. And then with that, I want to get a link and I want to be able to distribute this link to anybody and they should be able to tap a button and use a face ID or Google sign in or whatever, they should be able to instantly join into this contract so that they can make money based on the views on the tweet. So on launch day, what happens is they do a tweet that says, uh, we're offering community revenue sharing on this X post. There are 100 spots available, retweet to join. As soon as they do that, everybody starts to retweet it. So it gets like 400 retweets within the first 90 minutes. Now, everybody who retweets it receives this link. This link, they tap one time, they face ID, boom, they're in a smart contract with programmable digital money all on the blockchain. So it's not just on a website, it's on the blockchain. So all the money is basically digital money. Now, as a result of that, within seconds, it's not like the next day, within seconds, they're making money instantly. So the views are going up, they're making money, they're talking about it, it's gamified. They're all talking, it's more impressions, more impressions. It hits 20,000 views, they tweet, yo, we're going to put another thousand, it's going to go crazy. So it feels like a game. Everybody's talking, they're tweeting about the money they're making. And then after 24 hours is over and they say, okay, congrats. Now this could go on forever, but for this particular one, it was a 24 hour drop. And at the end, people can just cash out. So all the money is, uh, it's in crypto, but the technology enables you to cash out same day. You're just putting a debit card or your bank account number and it'll cash you out. So, so where'd the money come from? Did the money come from the New York company and say, hey, I'm depositing this? Yes, for this one, it came, it came from the New York company. Exactly. Oh, got it. And so in one scenario, it could be a brand deposits money, and then based on y'all's interaction, y'all get fractions of this somehow. And then another scenario might be, I'm selling this to people, 
right? Or let's just pretend if I was streaming on Spotify, I don't know if y'all can stream this, but in that, but but technically, it would be like, hey, if this is streaming on Spotify, if everybody who streams is getting a part of the money from their streams, is that how something like this would work effectively, or the dream of this platform would work? Exactly. Any any revenue stream on the internet. So the idea is this concept of a multiplayer internet where you can take any revenue stream on the internet and you can essentially share it with your community in exchange for different types of behaviors versus investment. Wow. And it solves the distribution problem, which to me was always the biggest problem as an artist. For sure. For sure. How do you keep this from being... Like how do you judge the effectiveness of somebody's, let's say, a retweet or interactions? Yeah, so... Um, in the beginning, we basically did it manually where we were just looking at who retweeted it and then sending links to people because they did what we asked them to do. There was on the live stream or you know, Twitter space. Um, now that it's grown, we are seeing that there are like bots that try to attack the network or like hackers will try to get in and get the drop before it comes out. So it's growing in sophistication where we need more reputation dynamics and things like that. Uh, I would say that's kind of like the next uh, chapter of evolution for the platform is like, just like in the early internet when you had to have like the right amount of information to make sure the person on eBay you was buying from was the right person. I think it's going to be like that too, where it's like revenue share, but we got to know who's who. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's super important. You also, I think the other thing is like, you want to see the history of who did stuff in the past. So like right now, one of the biggest problems as an artist is like, I might have a hundred or a thousand people that really, really love Unicorn or whatever I put out, right? But I don't know who they are. Like when I was first starting, I would go on SoundCloud and DM everybody who reposted my, my record and be like, yo, I appreciate that. Like just to see, just to make sure that they knew I, I was grateful so they would do it again. But there was no like official record of that. Um, but with this and with blockchain, you actually can have an official record of all the things that happened and you can use that to selectively and strategically say, okay, these are the people I want to co-own this particular thing or this particular thing and let's go out and win together. Right, right. No, that makes sense, man. That's, I mean, obviously, as it gets bigger, as you said, there'll be like new parts of exposure that you then solve for, because it's, you know, first you're just proving out the concept, but like, I, I love, I love the potential of this idea, you know, yeah, I, I love it, man. It, like, it reminds me of some tools that I, I've used, like in the past, pre blockchain at all right that did like some version of this on a small way less effective scale <laughs> it's, it's, uh, i don't think it's so much a new idea as much as this new technology that makes the idea even more scalable and even faster and more innovative yeah. street teams have been a thing for a long time frictionless. But, but frictionless and like tradable so now not only can you get in on the revenue stream but you can actually trade that right to somebody else you can track all these rights for different things we did it with an Instagram video where there's an event in Boston called Kickback Boston. And we partnered with them. We did a collab post. Uh, and we said, anybody who reposts this can join a contract that represents this Instagram post. We're going to pay the collective $50 per 1,000 impressions. And that night it got 1,400 shares. And the account has probably less than 5,000 followers. So it's just, it's just a new dynamic. The people seem to really love it because they're like, yo, rather than just liking things on Instagram or like commenting, I would love to be involved and be able to support and also feel like I'm part of the team. So that's what we've been seeing. I want to shift directions because I want to get your thoughts because of the space you're working in. But I have a, I have a thought process that people have complained about artists making the money that they should. Many types of creatives, right? And I think that, and the inefficiency of the music industry as, as opposed to others. Like anybody who has that outside of music experience really knows what I'm talking about when you, when you look at music and like the way you capture money and the way everything is built out that makes far less sense, right? And a lot of it gets blamed on, let's just say labels, industry, you know, institutions. And of course, to agree, there's a lot of bad acting there. But as I really thought through things over time, I think some of it is that but in terms of capturing the true value of IP, essentially, we just never have been able to do that, like technologically, because of the way IP moves, right? You have to be able to track it. How do you know that it's moving in a certain way where there was a period of time where 
You know, Ja'Cory could be in New York, create a dance, and then somehow that dance finds its way down here. But now today, you got people creating a dance, and then now they're getting credit on, on Fortnite. You know what I mean? Where we didn't know the origin. So this blockchain, you know, um, the evolution of blockchain and techno technology in general, I think it's just going to give us a way to actually capture the full value of IP in a way that just literally wasn't possible before. You know what I mean? Yeah, I completely agree. So there's a new term that's that's being um, used, which is programmable IP. So you're right that it just wasn't possible before. IP, typically to administer the rights around IP, you take the IP, you give it to a corporation, that corporation then will give you some blanket licensing agreement and the programmability of the IP is completely controlled by the corporation. If you want to have any control of the IP, you need to host it on your own website. Of course, the issue with that is you get no distribution. There's nobody on your website. So, so that doesn't really work. That's a non-starter. So the question is, where can you put IP where it can be programmable and where you can do things like say, well, I need to be attributed for this no matter where it goes on the internet, or I need to be paid this much no matter where it goes on the internet. Blockchain finally gives us that. It gives us programmable IP. Um, it's just taking a long time for it to actually become smooth enough and mainstream enough for it to really have impact. At that point, do you feel like it'll be easier for even just, let's say, when artist music get used in certain places? Because every platform tries to do that over time when it gets big enough. Well, you get, they get forced to do it, right? You got to say whose music is what and where did it come from. But especially for those smaller artists who might create something and it just blow up overnight, um, do you think it'll be easier for them to get paid all in all the micro videos that get created from it, almost like there's mini syncs? Um, I do think so. I think I think some of that stuff is happening. I think the, the thing artists gotta be careful about is like, and this goes to what your point about like the music industry kind of being a little different than other industries. If, if all of that is delegated to tech companies who make all the rules and they say, okay, here you go, here's how we're gonna do it. Um, then I still think history repeats itself. I think the, the artists have to take a more assertive approach into defining what the policies and what the actual technologies are versus waiting for some of this stuff to be put into play by corporations that don't actually have artists' best interests in mind. So I think a lot of it has to do with us actually owning some of the infrastructure and the technology um, versus saying like, okay, Spotify, please do this. YouTube, please do that. I think that's actually a big part of the problem. That makes sense. That makes sense. Hence, you building something on your side. There's other artists that are building things for sure. So, I mean, I I do see that as being the future, like more artists being involved in that way because it's so much easier before, too. Like the barrier, like you have awareness, but then you just have the barrier to creating tech or you can link with somebody who knows what to do on that side and you just be a partner in understanding the culture or what needs to be built and explain it. It seems like we're in a place where that could happen more frequently. Yeah, we're at, we're at a history, we're at a point of history with the internet right now where um, because, because distribution is so valuable, like the technology is actually almost a commodity now. Like any team with, with sufficient access to capital can build a lot of the same technologies. Like that's not really as hard as it used to be. What's difficult is like being Kendrick. Like, so if Kendrick just decides like, yo, I'm gonna create the next platform, he actually has a competitive advantage over any tech company because it's not that difficult to build the tech. I mean, don't get me wrong, it is difficult to build tech, but like being a culturally relevant icon is actually more rare right now than that and harder to replicate in terms of like a defensibility strategy. Agreed, very, very much so agreed. I, I was having this conversation the other day about how so much of tech, especially when it comes to like basic apps and things, it's easy, very, very easy um, because the groundwork has been laid, right? And a lot of these things, you don't even have to code. Like they have the no code solutions. The things that are innovative, like those are the things that like are hard, right? Or like like AI, like you, you need a certain level of engineer. There's so much being built there. But when it comes to creating your own version of Instagram, you can almost do that in probably a couple weeks or something, you know? <laughs> I, there's a difference between hard and expensive. Mm. You're right that it's not hard to build yeah. some products, but it is expensive. And so it, it is difficult because if you don't have access to capital, you're going to find it very difficult to compete when it comes to like the actual stuff that consumers want.
So the, the level of difficulty is decreasing because as you said, like now we have all this cloud infrastructure, we have all this stuff that you can use, but it is still expensive because it's competitive. You know, the, the markets are competitive. Um, but to your point, like, yeah, there are still technologies that are difficult too when it comes to AI, some of this like cryptography stuff, that stuff gets a little bit deeper. You also have to understand how to build as well, right? Like you gotta understand how to build it. And that's, that's the other thing is um, back to your point, we were talking earlier about languages, like, there's a difference between building an app versus knowing what's going on at every layer so that you can innovate and break rules. And you can say like, well, you know, even though you might tell me that's not possible, I know that it's possible because I, I understand the code. I understand this down to the, down to the, to the wire. Um, so that's what's exciting. I think if we can blend those two sides of like the cultural significance and the actual technical know-how and then the capital piece, which does matter, if you can blend all those things together, then I think you're going to see a different internet in the future. What would you like to see another artist build and work on, right? Outside of the category that, that you're working on, like Elon Musk, there's some other ideas out there, but I can't put my energy into it. Is there an idea you feel like an artist should take on that you can't take on yourself? Uh, man, that's a good question. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things happening I think in the the thing is I don't know if an artist if an artist can do it alone. I think I think there's a lot of things that need to be done for the youth youth programs. I think there's a lot of things that need to be done for people in need in terms of like social programs that technology can have an impact in. But it is incredibly expensive to make anything that's actually going to be be helpful. For example, like housing innovation stuff like that. I think would be dope. Uh, you know, there's things more important than music and social media. But I do think that innovation in this space with like distribution and social media actually underpins a lot of those things. Because if we can't talk to each other without something getting in the middle, then it's very difficult to collaborate. So like the fact that, you know, it's a blessing that, that I'm able to talk to you guys and that we was able to connect. But like if the internet keeps going the way that it's gone and like-minded people never actually can connect because there's algorithms that rank certain things and de and derank other things and it's, it's more difficult to find each other. Um, it's going to make it a lot harder for us to innovate and build a future that we want to see. Mm. Man, is there something else when it comes to formulas that like we miss? So we got the the obviously some monetization to share the smart contracts and what that looks like to activate. Um, is are there any things that that we're missing there? Because I mean, you got me highly intrigued in terms as a marketing engine. <laughs> That's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you. I think. Um, we covered the use cases. We talked about where where it came from. I think probably what's exciting is is what's next. So we're we're building out the platform to be even more self service. So Share Two is going to be coming out over the next couple of weeks, and what that means is you can go onto the platform and it's basically a smart contract uh, dashboard. It's an engine for all the stuff on the blockchain. You can create your own contracts. You can tie them to different types of digital property or digital assets, like we call them. You can create programmable IP. And most importantly, you can use it to build community because every time somebody joins one of these things, you get access to the email address. If they opt in, you get access to a push notification endpoint. And now you can do things like send a push notification to 10,000 people that says like, yo, we're going to be live tomorrow. All this, this stuff that I think traditionally has been gate kept by the platforms, what we want to do is just make it available and give it to you in a way that's like state of the art, using the best technology, but also super easy. So you don't have to think about things like crypto. Bet, bet. Man, y'all make sure y'all follow Brandon Tory. Uh, Brandon, it's straight Brandon Tory at IG, right? We'll put it at the bottom. EJ got that, man. Uh, like, check out Formless, even if it's, I know, you know, self service is coming soon. So, y'all just stay tuned for that. But follow this journey. I think it's highly needed. Um, and it's just dope to see you being the one doing it. Obviously, um, knowing you for a minute, reached out to you the beginning of the year. And now six months later, we finally actually making the interview happen. <laughs> you know, life is busy, but yeah, appreciate you being on, man. You know, I'm Brandon Man Sean, everybody. And I'm Corey. This is yet another episode of No Less Labels Necessary, and we out. Appreciate you for watching. If you like content like this, you'll love seeing our music marketing strategies that we use as an agency to actually blow up artists to millions and even billions of streams that are available for free at nolabelsnecessary.com. And the cool part about it that's going to really make you love it is we don't have to be all entertaining and add all this fluff just to get some views that we do on YouTube. 
we get straight to the information. There's play by play and courses that give you a breakdown of every step that you should do to get success. And you have the ability to have communication with us. We get on live talks, a lot of cool things for members and it's free just to hop in. So check it out right now at nolabelsnecessary.com.